Literally the last 35 years, I have studied well over a thousand of these near-death experience cases, where, and they talk about the same things. The creature and, of light, both a combination. You're, you're rushing through life and running through life trying to succeed, but what's the goal? <laughs> and she stops me and looks me in the eye and said, Daddy, you're not playing right. He mm. feels better than he's ever felt before. Not just five senses, but more like 50 senses. Yeah. Like looking into a thousand suns, but mesmerizing to look into. All over the globe, a woman in Tehran, a Muslim imam in Rwanda, an Australian professor, Hindus from India. But I interviewed CEOs. I interview commercial airline pilots, spine surgeons, frees you then to be yourself fully and offer to the world your gifts, your talents, what you can do, but without all the stress and worry and burden. John Burke is a speaker, pastor, and author of several books on near-death experiences, a topic I'm fascinated by, which is why I invited him on the pod. That is scary. Oh, wow. That's intense. Oh, what is that? Do you want to become more self-aware and clear about your goals? Try our free exponential score. In just five minutes, get a high-level picture of where you stand in key life dimensions. Get your personal life score at exponential.life slash score. How can something so ethereal, something that we perceive as um, disconnected from reality even, even mm -hmm. for those of us who are spiritual people, it feels that way. Uh, how can thinking of what happens after death inform how we build our lives day to day today <laughs> it's a giant question it is a giant it's an umbrella question i know well and i'll and let me start by saying you know i came at this as a skeptic uh literally an agnostic um i didn't believe in jesus i thought he was a legend um mm. and someone gave my dad the first research on near-death experiences when he was dying of cancer Wow. And and I saw the book on his bedside table and read it in one night. And I I said, oh, my gosh, like this could be actual evidence that this God, Jesus, mm -hmm. soul lives on stuff is real. Now, I wasn't convinced, but it opened my mind. And I and I later I started reading, and studying the Bible. I came to faith. I was an engineer. So I've I. I worked as an engineer. I've always had a very analytical, skeptical, like, how does it work? And how do you know and prove it? kind of mine. Um, so literally the last 35 years, I have studied well over a thousand of these near-death experience cases where, where people clinically die. You know, they have no heartbeat, they have no brain waves, and yet they come back, they're resuscitated or miraculously revived after minutes, sometimes hours, and they talk about the same things. And the same things all around the world, literally that there is, that they experienced a life more real than this one in a place more beautiful than earth has ever been, relational reunions, and in the presence of this God of light and love who is personal and knew them intimately. And, and here's where we'll tie it in, is that he often gives them a life review. Time yes. works differently on the other side. And all these things are commonalities of what they say. Time works differently. So they literally relive their lives from the perspective of what really matters. And it's fascinating. And so, yeah. So how does it tie in? Well, it completely ties in. It's kind of like um, you're, you're rushing through life and running through life trying to succeed, but What's the goal? <laughs> we pursue and we're driven to do things because we lack love, because we're sometimes scared, because we want to prove our grandpa wrong <laughs> or something like that. And and it seems to me what you're saying is essentially the meta version of that. How do you how do you make that connection? You go, oh, I'm I'm motivated by the wrong things. Let me replace it with the right things. And what is it that I'm replacing it with? Yeah. And then how does that influence? what I do then day to day, hour to hour. Even after moving from engineering into pastoral ministry, I, you know, I look back now and there are a lot of years of my life that I call it running on bad fuel. Right. I was well, running, yeah, but it was, it was bad fuel and it left a lot of junk in the tank. You know, it's like after a while it gets all clogged up. I've left engineering. 
I was now in ministry. I was doing, you know, really well. I mean, what, what does that even mean? <laughs> doing really well in ministry. Right. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. But it, you know, you can just take the same mentality and, and shift That's right. it. And, yeah. and I was, you know, I was a musician. So I was trying to record an album. I was trying to write a book. I was leading a management team with 300 staff at the age of 29. It was crazy. And I was working on a master's degree all at the same time. Yeah, that's, right? that's, that is doing well. I think officially for most people, they would look at that and go, this guy's doing well. Exactly. And, and I, I had a three-year-old daughter, my little daughter, Ashley, and I wanted to be a good father. Okay. Yeah. I, I really wanted to be a good father. And I'm down on the ground playing Barbies with her one day. And I'm, you know, I'm doing the Barbie with her, but I'm really studying for a, a test. <laughs> <laughs> and, and she stops me and looks me in the eye and said, Daddy, you're not playing right. Oh. Three. Wow. Now, Christian, it went to my soul because I knew in yeah. that moment, in that moment, it was like God was saying, you're not fooling anybody but yourself. Mm -hmm. You mm -hmm. say you want to be a good father, but you're not going to be unless you seek me on this. Oh, my gosh. That's amazing. But now to say uh, that was all it took. No, no, of course. No, not. We're talking years, but it was the beginning. And I did. And I, I was in a men's group where I began to open up. We were it was a, a really safe group to share everything, you know, your sins, your struggles, your highs and lows. And, um, and I started sharing about this and they were, you know, they started asking me questions like, well, you know, cause my question was why, why do I always live out in the future, conquering the next mountain, you know, exactly. Like, exactly. And, 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 and why do I always redline? Like if, if this is the red line, I'm always like right up here where it's screaming. Right? Oh my gosh. Yes. Yes. But, but here's the harder part is if you had asked me, you know, well, and, and these guys did, they said, you know, well, okay, you know, success, I'm, I'm going to succeed. That drove me. Mm -hmm. I was like, well, what if you don't? And I was like, well, that's not an option. Yep. You're but driven. Literally. You're driven. You are driven. You're self-driven. But I did not know why. You and don't know that's why. That's yeah. the key. And, and, you know, they started asking me questions like, well, did you, did you feel like you had to prove yourself to your dad, like prove to earn his love or your mom's love? And I was like, no, not at all. Like and they didn't, I knew they loved it. They believed in me. They like, mm -hmm. you know, you're going to do great things and blah, blah, blah. Well, so I, it didn't make sense. And for two years I was seeking God on this. Two years later, I was doing uh, the, I was at the funeral of my grandmother on my dad's side. Now my dad died, you know, uh, 30, 40 years ago. Um, and, and this is my grandmother, his mom, and I'm talking to his sister and she is my only relative on my dad's side that's left. And I, I realized, you know, as I'm preparing to say some things at my grandmother's funeral, I don't even know my grandfather's name. Oh, wow. What I did know about him is that my dad could not stand him. Um, okay, interesting. And, and, and growing up, my dad would always, he'd have me out working and he'd say to me things like, you know, you're going to know the, the value of hard work and you're not, you're not going to be a bum. And if he ever saw someone that he thought was a bum, mm -hmm. he would get visibly angry and say, my son is not going to be like that. Okay. okay. Mm -hmm. So there were some messages like that. But it didn't connect until I asked my his sister at my grandmother's funeral, what was my granddad like? And this otherwise happy, jolly, you know, wonderful woman gets visibly angry and said he was a bum. Oh, wow. Exact words. Exact words. Exact words. And it was like the Holy Spirit pulled the curtain back and went, there it is. There it is. That's the, that's is. the bad fuel. That is the bad and, fuel. My dad and, and mom, they did love me. They did believe in me. But my dad's hatred and hurt 
that had never been healed, that he did not seek God to heal and forgive mm -hmm. his father was like bad fuel that transferred to me. It was so similar to me in, in that way that I have um, three generations of broken homes. Um, so family was this pain point, this, mm -hmm. this agony, right? And I, on the surface, I was very confident and driven. And, and I realized much, much later that I, and I think part of it was that part of it was just moving around when I was a kid and not fitting in, not fitting in, being an outsider, being an outsider is that I, I pursued a, a career in show business as a singer because I wanted to guarantee love. Mm -hmm. And I would do anything to achieve that. And you're, you're wanted, you're sought after. Exactly. You're exactly. valuable. Mm -hmm. And of course, when you get there and you start, you know, moving millions and, uh, you know, selling millions of albums and playing sports arenas, you realize, uh, doesn't work that quite work that way so <laughs> it's bad fuel it's bad fuel and then it informs yeah. the way you do things and if you don't switch to good fuel um uh, it's just it, even the achievements that you have they are empty they they just they make you miserable well and they might make you feel good and that's even worse because you're leaving wreckage that's right you. Yes, exactly. Yeah. You know, so, so my, my bad fuel worked really well. <laughs> it, it's very effective. Yes, it is. It's in the very, short run, it's very effective. <laughs> in, in, in the way the world measures success, you do get the external. The problem is you're missing what at the heart matters most. What I'm trying to do in Imagine the God of Heaven is literally show what God's been revealing through the scriptures all along. But through illustrated by 70 people from every continent. Now think about that, every continent. And yet when they encounter God, he's the same God. And he's the same God who's been revealing himself through throughout history. And many times in his presence, they, they get a life review. And that brings a lot of clarity. So I'll give you a couple of stories. Like this one, um, Howard Storm, um, because his is very insightful. Um, he, he grew up in a very abusive environment. His dad was emotionally, physically, verbally abusive constantly. It was, it was horrible. And, um, and when Howard got older, he said, um, you know, he, he turned from every, every thought of God or church or anything like that. And he was just anti, he was an atheist. He was a, um, a tenured college professor and got these accolades and awards, but he, but he told me honestly that he was also, he was unfaithful. He was, you know, his whole mantra was the biggest, baddest bear in the woods wins, uh -huh. right? Yep. But he was successful, you know? And, um, and then he has his uh, duodenum rupture while he's on a, an art tour in uh, France. And usually, you know, it's like five hours and you die. What was the weekend? They couldn't get a surgeon. They couldn't find a surgeon. Eight hours, nine hours later, he dies. And now he thought when you die, it's just unplug the computer. It's just blank screen. There's nothing. And so he didn't even know he was dead. And as is common with near-death experiences, his, his first thing is he's standing there in the room and he feels wonderful. He mm. feels better than he's ever felt before. Not just five senses, but more like 50 senses. And, and he's, you know, everything is highly vivid. And, and he has these nice people come in the hallway and say, Howard, come with us. We're here for you. And he thinks it's the hospital staff. Finally, they found a surgeon. They're going to help me. And, and so he goes with them. And it's, it, is, it turns out to be a hellish near-death experience, which, oh. which by the way, 23% of, of, of near-death experiences that have come forward are hellish. You know, there, there are heavenly ones and there are hellish ones. So you got to make sense of both. And I try to, I try to make, help do that, but he is deceived by these people and they lead him into this outer darkness, just like Jesus talked about. And they turn on him and they just maul. Him. And you know, he's, he's multiple times I've interviewed him where he said, I can't go any farther than that because really? I still have PTSD from it. Oh, wow. So it's not a, 
This is not a dream. This is not a dream. This is more real, they say, than anything we experience here. And we can talk more about that, but but here's the critical thing is in that place. And again, just like just like Peter said in, in 2 Peter 3 8, to the Lord, a, a day is like a thousand years and a thousand years is like a day. Well, they say time doesn't work the same. You know, it's it's multidimensional. And so they they don't know was this was this hours or was this years? And oh and wow, he's, really? He's, he's there and and in this the midst of this horrific experience he hears in his chest call out to god pray to god and he's still now this is an important insightful thing in in his pride even in this horrific thing place he is he says i don't believe in god i don't pray to god Uh he's his ego is still fighting and I know, and he keeps hearing pray to God. And so he didn't even, he didn't know, know how to pray, but he just starts piecing together, you know, my country, tis of thee, God bless America, anything you could think of with God <laughs> oh in it. Gosh. Oh, wow. And these, and these horrific people, he thinks they, they were, were people just completely. Who, so they're, who, they're people, they're spirits, they're, what, what are they? He thinks they were his kindred spirits so his kindred people who were just like him on earth oh, and wow. that's what he was going to devolve into it oh, right. was it was dominate or be dominated terrorize oh. or be terrorized mm-hmm. it's the free will gone gone mad without the restraining force of the holy spirit that's right and do you think earth. do you think that whole outer darkness concept because it's so so hard for us to grasp, even though even those of us who study the Bible, and let alone people that are like your friend who was not even a believer in the first place. What is that? Is that is that a place of punishment? Is is it the absence of God? No, what he clearly said, and and what you know, one of my favorite writers, C.S. Lewis, also said, is he said this this was God giving the free will creature, what he demands, stay out of my life. Oh yeah. But if God is light and God is love and God is life and God, and you demand that he stay out, what do you get? Oh, wow. That's, that's intense. And, and, and that's what he was experiencing, but in the midst of this, so he starts praying and just saying the word God and they start, they, they're, they're, cussing at him and mm-hmm. telling them there is no God, but they were backing off. And then he remembers a song from when he was brought to Sunday school as a little kid, Jesus loves me. Those are the only words they could remember. And okay. he started thinking about it. And he thought, even if Jesus is, why would he love me? Why would he help me? And, but in his desperation, he just cried out enough, Jesus save me. Mm-hmm. And into this darkness comes this brilliant light, brighter than the sun, which is common all around the globe of this God that is, is a thousand times brighter than the sun. But you can look in, you can look at him and arms reach out, pick him up and take him out of that place. Now, he's he realizes I was wrong. <laughs> this is Jesus. And in the presence of Jesus. As Jesus is holding him with these angels, he gets a life review. Okay. And now the life review is, they, they talk about it in many ways, but to summarize, imagine watching your life relived in a 3D panoramic display where you are feeling and thinking all the things you were feeling and thinking, but you're also feeling and thinking and experiencing what the people that you're interacting with are feeling and thinking too. You are. Oh, wow. That is, that is scary. Okay. I must say. And every act of kindness, you see how it affected the other. Some saw how it rippled through humanity, 10, 20, 30 times, the positive ripple effect through humanity. Um, You feel what what your words many times do to others and how it how it ripples oh, from wow. them yeah it's exactly what jesus said 
you know, when, when in Matthew 25, when he said, you know, in that day, uh, when you did this for the least of these, when you, you, did you gave a me. cup of water, yeah. you, you, sh you showed up and, you know, when I was sick, you visited me in prison, all this. Well, when did we do that for you? Well, and he said, when you did it for the least of these, you yes, did yeah. it to me. And of course, he well, also he also mentions every careless word. And every careless word. Yeah. Wow. And so so this is real. And oh, wow. consistently, these people all across the globe experience it. Now, they also experience the unconditional love and acceptance of God at the same time. As they're getting the review. As they're getting the review. He okay. does not stop loving them. We are his children. We are all meant to be his children. Even those who reject him. He still loves them like you are the only one he ever created. And this is another amazing thing about God. You know, perfect parenting would be what God is. You never remove your love, but you also don't deny the consequences of bad actions so that, That's right. so that mm -hmm. your child doesn't feel separated from your love but they also realize there are consequences to your actions that's right yeah and that's exactly what the life review is now howard in this so what was fascinating that comes back around to our point is that in this life review he sees first of all he he sees he said that all the emphasis for him and it's different for different people but all the emphasis for him were on relationships and he's going through his life and he says to Jesus, because he now feels so comfortable in the presence of Jesus, because God, God is relatable. This is what I'm trying to show in the book, too. God is the love you have always wanted. He's the friend you've always wanted. He's the parent you've, you, you've always wanted or maybe lacked. He's, he's, he's even better than the spouse that you thought was the all in all. I mean, it's, right. it's wild. But in his presence, he, he says to Jesus, wait a second, you're skipping the most important part of my life. You know, this is when I won Kentucky Artist of the Year and I had this big <laughs> banquet in my honor and they gave me this big cash prize. And that was the pinnacle of my existence, what I live for. Oh, wow. And Jesus, and Jesus says, that's not important. I want you to see how you treated the students. Okay, interesting. He was a professor. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh -huh. And he shows him a time when this student came into his office and, you know, he's an 18-year-old kid and, and he's one of his art students and he's heartbroken because of a breakup. And Howard is reliving this and he's hearing this kid, but he's also hearing his thoughts again that they don't pay me enough for this crap. You yes. Know, Yes. What am I doing? Listen, do, like I really care about your love life, you know? Exactly. Yeah, the kid's crying and he and he said, I what I realized is he actually thought I was kind enough to care about it. Right. Oh wow. Mm. And I didn't. I didn't care at all. And Jesus was showing me, you know, this is what mattered. This is what mattered most. Wow. That's really now what he also saw is with his father. And he said, you know, what I realize is I, I used to think, you know, my father was, was a bad man and he was, um, but I also saw that where I thought I was completely the victim and, you know, everyone, all these bad people were doing all this stuff to me, it was a two way street because yes, my father was a bad person and he was abusive, but then I turned around and did everything I could to hurt him back and be as rebellious as I could. And it was like this, this fire that just kept blazing out of control. And Jesus was trying to show me that I needed to take responsibility for me. And again, it comes back to that, you know, whatever happened to us or whatever the past, before God, we can take responsibility of ourselves and we can let him in to begin to lead and guide and heal and replace the bad fuel with good fuel. And that's, and that is what Howard came back and did. Interesting. Did he, when, when you interview those people and you hear the stories, when it comes to what they see and experience, is it, do they, do they see a human being of flesh and blood, a creature of light, both a combination do you feel like it's a projection that 
God will manifest itself in in a in a way that we can sort of process, or otherwise are, we wouldn't be able to handle about, it. About seeing God. Yeah, yeah, yeah. The experience, and is it is it the presence of God, or is it Jesus, the person? How how does that? Yes how do people perceive yes. those things? I yes guess. and yes. So, so it's just it's fascinating, and that's that's really I'm I'm, I'm showing in Imagine the God of Heaven the whole story and history of God and attributes and character and heart of God that's been, that's in the scriptures, it's there and it's written in history. But these people from all around the globe are saying the same things. They are illustrating the same thing. So I'll give you another quick illustration. Um, Rajiv was a chief anesthesiologist at Bakersfield Heart Hospital. Okay. Didn't believe that NDEs were a thing, even though he had heard people who come back from anesthesia you know, or surgery who had died, say this happened and he would give him a shot of antipsychotic drug. <laughs> and then he had one. He oh, had one. He did. He had one. And that's his professional field. So he's literally adjacent to it, basically professionally. And it's completely changed his life. But initially he too started out, he, he had, it, it's the same generational Thing. His father was very abusive. He had become um, a, a, an alcoholic and abusive toward his son and materialism was all he cared about. And he starts off in a hellish experience as well, cries out to God in repentance, he said, that's his words. And he said these two Christian angels, and he, that's how he identified them. He said then, Christian angels, interesting. Yes, take him to this place of exquisite beauty of mountains and trees and forests and valleys, but with vibrant colors beyond anything our color spectrum has. And into the presence of this God of light, who is, he said, a thousand suns, like oh. looking into a thousand suns, but mesmerizing to look into. And in his presence, he, and the communication is thought to thought heart to heart, complete, pure. Mm -hmm. And he said to him, I'm going to send you back. But first, I want you to see your life again to see what needs to change. Okay. Okay. The life and, review again. And he yes. sees it again. He sees his, his life review and he, and he realizes. Um, and, and he feels this incredible love and acceptance. And he thought when he saw his life review, he's going to send me back to hell. That's what I deserve. Yeah. And instead he 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 gets this very personal intimate compassion and love and care. And he said I had a thought that that light was Jesus. Now later he encounters the same brilliant god of light and he asks. He says, "Who are you, Lord?" And just like Saul in Acts chapter uh, nine on the Damascus Road. Remember yeah. Saul, yeah, of course, who, who became Paul, is persecuting Christians. He didn't believe in Jesus at all. And this brilliant God of light appears to him, and he says, "Who are you, Lord?" And he says, "I'm Jesus, who you're persecuting." Oh, well, Rajiv, wow. Rajiv, this Hindu asks, "Who are you, Lord?" And he said, "Out of the light steps a man with a in a white robe of light, with a beard and." holds out his hands like this and he says, I'm Jesus, your savior. Oh, wow. And he drops to his feet and says, namaste. And he, he had no, the thing is he doesn't have a cultural context to conjure that up. No. And I'm showing this again and again and again, all over the globe, a woman in Tehran, uh, a Muslim, a mom in Rwanda, um, an Australian professor, several other Hindus from India, all over the globe. They are experiencing the same God and they never want to leave his presence. And it's amazing. Mm. It's amazing. But, but back to our point, um, Rajiv also realizes that, you know, there's this generational thing that tends to get passed down. And, and God wanted to heal him of that, but he had to let it. That's right. You know, as long as we're just locked in, like, you know, biggest, baddest bear in the woods wins, 
He's like, and, and this is the thing that we have to understand. God's MO is love. That is the point of it all. But we don't often understand the consequences of love. So you might fall in love with someone, but you can't make them love you. That's right. You know, you can you can give them many, many good gifts, and they may hang around, but they might not love you at all. They might love the good gifts. That's right. Mm -hmm. You can you could put a gun to their head and say, live with me and tell me you love me. But we all know forced love is not love at all. Of course. But what we don't realize is it's the same with God. That when God created us, he, in essence, limited himself to interacting with creatures that he will not force. Well, this ritual, we come out with dad, my wife, and we stare at the stars. And, and it's mesmerizing because mm -hmm. it is, in its enormity, it makes us feel like nothing. We're a speck mm -hmm. in all kinds of levels, physically, time span, lifespan, life span, all of that significance, even understanding what grasping what this even is, we're nothing. We're close to nothing. Very, We're but a mist, in the words of you know, King Solomon. As a believer, I, I, I find it hard to just understand and connect the dots. How does a, the creator of this care about me? Are you enjoying this podcast and ready to level up? Discover high-performance coaching at Exponential. Visit exponential.life to book your free strategy call. You can tell us where you are, where you want to go. We'll give you free advice. And if it's a good fit, we'll tell you all the amazing results our clients are getting and all the details about Exponential. Here's the other thing. I mean, we didn't even get into all the evidence for why what convinced me is a skeptical That's right. engineer. That, that these, are, these are based in reality. Like there's verifiable factual studies and things that base us in reality. But I interview CEOs, I interview commercial airline pilots, spine surgeons, bank presidents. These are people, what do they have to gain making up these crazy wild stories of dying and meeting God? That's right. Hindus yeah. who meet the God of Jesus and now follow Jesus. It's like Muslims who are, are now, you know, now he's had seven attempts on his life. This imam in Rwanda, because Jesus rescued him and he came back telling everyone about Jesus. It doesn't, so they don't gain anything. And to me, that's additional evidence that they're is, telling yeah. the truth. But, but the thing that, um, that is astounding is again and again and again, I quote them as, as, as saying, you know, when I was with him, when I was in his presence, you know, I've, I've, I've known love before. I've experienced love for a child, you know, but I've never looked into the eyes of love itself. Oh, wow. That's beautiful. And that's what they say. It's like you get lost in his eyes. And then they'd say things. And again and again, they would say, and I know this wasn't true, but I felt like I was the only one he loved. Yeah, yeah. Or, uh -huh. or, another, or, or another would say, you know, I would, I would, I would think about someone else, and then I realized, oh, he loves them like they're the only one he loves. And with every switch of my thought, I realized each one of us, he has a love for each one of us that is unique That's to right. each one of us, as if we are the only one. And, and, and I say, how can that be? Because we're so nothing. But that is how great God is, and that's what I'm trying to show people. And yeah, it, because it changes the way you live this life when you realize how significant you are to the only one who really matters. That's it right. It frees you then to be yourself fully and offer to the world your gifts, your talents, what you can do, but without all the stress and worry and burden because you can't fail being you. If, if you experience love yourself and you have the practices to support that so that you feel it rather than just think it, you look at anybody else who is a potential irritant and you start understanding they're loved, they're his, and they are loved just like you are. You can't treat them badly. You can't treat, you can't call somebody, this is a loser, this is a bum. And you can't, right. that's, it's impossible to judge in my, in my opinion. How do we keep that experience? How do we, first of all, become more aware of this more regularly? So Randy was a CEO, had an embolism, a pulmonary embolism shut his body down, heart stops, 
he cries out to Jesus as he's leaving his body. He's taken up and he's, and he's there and he's feeling the hug from the side of Jesus and he feels his beard on his face. This is real. <laughs> wow. I know. It's not that's amazing. It's, not, it's amazing. Th that's the thing that people don't understand. This is the less real. They say. This is the yeah. What we are experiencing now is we're in the shadow. That's, that's right. The real thing. That's the real thing. Yeah. And 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 so he he again he he's walking with Jesus through the this beauty and and um, and Jesus says I'm I'm going to send you back, beloved. And he's like, no, I don't <laughs> want to go back. And he right. still had family and kids he loved and everything, but he said, and this is common, like. No, this is where I was meant to be. This is home. You know, I don't want to go back there. And he said, no, I'm sending you back. You still have a purpose to fulfill on earth. And okay. that's common, what God says to them. Right. You still have a purpose to fulfill. So Randy's a CEO. He's five-year plan, 10-year plan. You know, of he's course. like, yeah. you know, that driven. And he said, okay, if I have to go back, then, then tell me. Tell me, what's my purpose? What am I supposed to do? That's right. And Jesus said to him, no, I won't tell you because you'll get out of, ahead of me. Oh, wow. Moment by moment, I'll reveal to you your purpose. Oh, that's beautiful. And, and probably maddening to the CEO. <laughs> well, but, it, but it's also so instructive. And, and you know what, it Christian? Is. It's exactly what Jesus said is last night on earth. In John chapter 15, he said, just like a branch abides in, in a vine and right. grapes grow naturally. You abide or stay connected to me and you'll bear much fruit. Much fruit. But apart yes. from me, you can do nothing. You can do nothing. That's now right. we can do a lot apart from Jesus, apart from mm. God, right? In the world's eyes. Yes. But the only way that we really live out the purpose we're here for is we learn to, to walk with him humbly throughout the day asking, talking, listening. Some call it prayer, but it's just conversation. It is. It's like, okay, Lord, here's this person in my office right now. What do you want me to hear? What do you want me to say? What can That's I right. do for them? Mm -hmm. Okay. Okay. God, I've got this massive, you know, supply chain issue in COVID and I don't know how to solve it. And it's going to, it's going to cause problems for all these people. Show me what can I do? What's the next right thing I can do? That's right. And in faith, you do it. And you'll be amazed at how God actually wants to do work with you. He cares about the things that you thought he didn't care about. He does. And what would you, what would it matter to achieve all these things and, and gain nothing and not be, feel that love, that presence, right? The things that we pursue, the bad fuel, um, Oh man, I've I've seen it in my life. I've seen it in so many lives. Is that, I mean, it's decades spent with bad yeah. fuel and not not experiencing what you're describing right now. And I think you know the 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 biggest thing to remember if you have lived down that road is that God is full of compassion. That's right. And what He did through Jesus was to forgive us of past, of present and even future sins and wrongs, but also he wants to heal us. He, want, he, wants to, he wants to heal those wounds that have been inflicted. Um, he, wants to, he wants to make us, like you were saying, whole, where the motivation is that we, we're so grateful and we're so filled up with, with his love and peace and joy, the unburdened way. Of That's Jesus. Right. Jesus said, if you're burdened and weary, come to me, learn from me because I'm gentle and humble of heart and I'll teach you. I'll give you rest for your souls. Mm -hmm. So you can accomplish a ton, mm -hmm. but you can do it in a way that is unburdened. I think it starts with just realizing that um, God is already there with you and he knows it all. He That's knows right. you better than you know yourself. Find a good church get into a, a small group not everyone will be safe not every person is mm -hmm. experiencing the grace and the love and the acceptance of god so they can't mediate it to others but you can find it if you ask for it oh, absolutely. Um, i think a good coach or a good uh a good coach or christian therapist as well 
can serve you well at times? You can be completely unburdened. You can be free. You can run on, on good fuel. And then you're free to actually do what you're supposed to do and be the gift that you are to all of us, to the rest of us here. That's right. Um, and that's just a beautiful, what a beautiful thing. And what it's even more beautiful that it's not just, you know, like this inspiration, self-help type of stuff in the sense of just motivation. This is reality. This is more real than what we think is real. And that's what I love about your book, about your research, about your decades of experience and and digging into that. And I, I think you, I think you bring so much value and so much, I mean, even I feel ministered to as I'm listening to you. Mm. Um, and I'm sort of in this, you know, yeah. in this journey and I go, Oh yeah, that's such a great reminder. What a beautiful thing. And I don't need to stress out at all. And it's, it's liberating. And, uh, well, it's not from me. <laughs> that's right. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> it's from, it's from the Lord, but it is your gift. Uh-huh. That's, that's what you're doing here on earth and your blessing. Yeah. Uh, thousands and probably millions. So thank you for, I really, really, really sincerely thank you for coming on. And I'm, I'm grateful that I know you, that we get to sort of connect every once in a while. And um, I really pray that your message spreads more widely into spaces that are completely unexpected and, and has sort of that ripple effect that you spoke about. Oh, well, thanks. I appreciate it.